verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Normally, I would leave the pulpit at this time, but Bert has asked me to join him in this presentation. I have no idea what's going to happen, so... <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, well. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. It's good to see everyone here. Uh, this is very unusual to see this many people. So it's kind of like a, it's, a, it's a blessing, but it is different. And everybody knows what's going on, so we're not going to repeat uh, CNN and a Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We're going to... Praise the Lord this morning. And um, I'd like to let everyone know that uh, God is extremely good. Just for you to be here and in good health, to have an expression on your face, and to have gotten up out of the bed without federal assistance, you are in a marvelous condition. And so um, the topic for today is grace because it's something that we really, really need, and we need to have more of it every day. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer, and uh, we'll pray together, and we'll uh, get into the presentation. Um, let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for allowing us to have a Sabbath day with you and enjoy the fellowship and communion together. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. We ask that you would intervene by the power of your Holy Spirit and allow us, Lord, to have a peace of mind that you love us and you care for us and that you want us to be with you. Thank you in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, the topic today, um, we have... 2 Corinthians 12, um, 2 Corinthians 12, and it's verses 9 and 10. Brother Marty just read it, and um, I want to, to read it once again because it's an expression of grace. Um, let's read it again. It says, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, when we talk about grace, there's a lot of uh, definitions of grace. Um, but we want to be specific of how God's grace is imparted to us. This is the scripture text that we just read Paul had three special prayer meetings, and he kept asking God for relief. And the text we just read, God let him know, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, Brother Marty, this is where I need you. On the text, as the text come up, I'm pretty much printing them all out, but uh, Ephesians 2.8, Yes, please. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace. grace you want me to read that? Yes, go ahead. Grace is power. Grace is the power of God that makes a man adequate to fulfill the divine purpose for which man was created. The life is my life. Push the button on the line. Okay. Did everyone hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, man's natural condition 
were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And Corinthians 5.19 says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In John 3, 7, it says, Jesus said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, Mark. Blessed. God originally empowered man with potential and talents. Genesis 1, verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. What are we blessed to do? A blessing by God is the divine empowering to fulfill those built-in abilities which God planned would be performed by his creatures. God created man to live and enjoy worship and fellowship. God created a day of worship, the seventh day Sabbath. Revelation, Revelation 4.11 says, go ahead, Marty. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Purpose, Ephesians 1.9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. And Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. John 3.16, God sacrificed his only begotten son to his own justice and has set us free, set free from the eternal perishing of our soul. God offers, offers us eternal life, John, 3, 80, John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be freed indeed. God did everything for us to atone for our sins, according to Romans 3, 21 through 26. Power of the cross, Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Grace, God showed us love at Calvary. He took action to save us totally outside of our own effort. That includes you and me. God did 100% for us outside of us because he loves us. Amen. We know little about love and less about God. We need to begin somewhere to get an understanding. Let's begin with the foundation which consists of three words comes from John, 1 John 4, 4, 8, and 16. For God is love. Love makes ideal relationships. Love is not emotions. Love sets practical relationships by, with, and between other beings. Love is the highest divine principle. Love is the highest divine principle. Example, in agriculture, you have a seed, plants, trees, soil, and water. The atom, the smallest known uh, thing for making up things, the proton, neuron, electron, and the proton and the neuron make up the nucleus. Time, we have seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall, which make up also for planting and harvesting. Uh, weather, we have sunshine, we have clouds, we have rain, we have hail, ice, and snow. In our bodies, we have our brain, our heart, our lungs, kidneys, our digestive tract, everything working in harmony, the true shalom, the true peace of God, working in us and around us at all times. Adam and Eve broke their relationship with God. They broke their relationship with each other. How do we relate to people in our lives? How can we make our relationships better? Make a list of the people that you want to improve your relationships with and then pray over the list each day. Law of God. The law of God explains how to maintain relationships between God and man, and man with everyone, everywhere. Jesus is the true tabernacle. The heavenly sanctuary gave us a pattern 
and that is during the time of Moses, there was a, a sanctuary on earth, and I believe you saw a picture of that earlier today in the children's story. In John 4, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Truth. What is truth? Summary, the truth is the essence of what should be done as outlined in the Bible, God's word. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 1 Kings 17, 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. Truth. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. John 1, 14, 17, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then down to verse 17, yeah. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Second John 1, 3, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. Psalms 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And John 14.15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Hebrews 4.4, 4, For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Sabbatismos. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll read that. <laughs> Sabbath is blessed, an empowered, set aside day for worship. The moss, on the end of that, is the process of keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign, a mark of creation. It's a gift from God to us, distinguished from other days. Go ahead. First John 4, 8 and 16, we have the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, 17, and a dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed which the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The everlasting gospel addresses us now in 2020, and we need it now more than ever before. This earth is temporary. An example of temporary existence is Noah and Lot. Noah built a huge boat, and it had never rained before. That took great faith and great obedience. Lot had a warning, and his warning uh, preceded him leaving out, led by angels, him and his two daughters, and they survived the total destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In each epic historical event, a male and a female survived. And if you know about Lot, um, the history of Lot, out of that lineage, the Moabites, Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth was an ancestor to David. David was an ancestor to Jesus Christ. So it's very important to see how God preserves what he started, whether it be seed, um, harvest, all of that is a plan for the perpetuation of whatever it is that God originally created. Second Peter. Second Peter, uh, chapter three, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Matthew 24, 29 says, Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
Now this is a very important passage because these events, some of these events have happened uh, in 1790 or thereabouts. Um, there was a, what they call a dark day and there was a time, um, there was the Lisbon earthquake. Uh, all of this happened in about the 1700s. And then about 1844, we know there was a huge event that happened in the heavens above where Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place in heaven. And so we know based on historical patterns that we're living in a very special time. And we know that God is all powerful because he's the only one that can shake the heavens and the earth. So it's very important for us to pay attention to what is going on, not only in the world, but what's going on in heaven on our behalf to save us. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21, 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now this is an important passage because this is what we all anticipate. We want to make it to heaven. So we need the grace of God in order to be in that city, the New Jerusalem. The remnant, survivors of the great tribulation, living in a new way with a new spirit, are invited to walk in the new earth by the grace of God. We desire to keep the commandments of God. Four of the commandments define the relationship of our eternal Lord God. Six define our relationships with our fellow human beings. We need to pray to have the faith of Jesus. We need to pray to receive grace to help us. We need to pray to receive the Holy Spirit. This is an important challenge for all of us because it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with God and it's about a relationship with our fellow human beings. Men and women, boys and girls, having the kind of relationship that is of love and of grace. Grace we cannot produce, love we know little about. So we have to go to our creator, our maker in prayer and seek him because he's the only one that can make us whole again. Isaiah 53, story of, surf, uh, story of the suffering servant, Messiah fulfilled. Go ahead and do all three. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 58, it's fasting and Sabbath. Isaiah 59, sin separates Israel from God. Israel's confession, Zion's redeemer. Now Isaiah 53 gives us the story of Jesus. It was the prophecy of Jesus in the book of Isaiah which was very thorough in providing the prophetic forecast that the Messiah would come to Israel. Israel, however, had been so long at war and fighting other nations and conquering territories that when the Messiah came, they did not recognize him. Now notice in chapter 58, the prophet wrote about fasting and Sabbath. Fasting and Sabbath is very important. Now the fasting has to do with uh, the, the children of Israel had, a, had ceremonial things that they did. And they got caught up in the actions rather than the who. The who being worship God in spirit and in truth, but they got caught up in worshiping the commandment and the ceremonies and the things that went around worshiping God. Now, sin separates, separates Israel from God. And we could put Israel, we could just say our personal name. So sin separates Bert from God. So it's important that Bert understands about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ, and that Bert forms a relationship with our Lord. Israel's confession, that's a prayer move. So you see... In these three chapters, you see fasting, you see Sabbath, you see confession, confession being prayer. So these are the keys to the Messiah, the prayer, the Sabbath,
having the relationship, worshiping the true God in the heavens above. And Zion is another name for Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem. That's where we want to go. Okay, go ahead and read this one, please. The gospel of grace. But none of these things move me, neither I count my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of grace of God. Acts 20, 24. Now this again is Paul writing. Notice he talks about uh, his, his attitude. When we look at this passage and we look at 2 Corinthians, we could see that he had a sincere desire to serve the Lord. And through all of what he was going through, he actually um, wanted to finish the course, finish the race. You notice he says that several times. He didn't expect to be immortal on earth. He knew that there was a finish to what he was doing. Um, there's a passage in, um, in Romans, uh, let's see if I can get to it. It's Romans chapter 8. And I'll say this to, to you while I'm trying to find the text. Romans chapter 8. And I'll go to the, to the next one. I guess it went off. It went off. That's okay. Romans chapter 8. Um, go to Romans chapter 8. And I want to read this, um, read this passage, if you'll step over here mm -hmm. to read this. Romans chapter 8, uh, 35. To just, the, just 35. Yeah, yeah, in, in All the way. Yeah. Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? That is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor present things, or nor things to come, nor height, or depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You can see that Paul had a very significant relationship with God. Now what's interesting is Romans was written long ago, and it has been said by some theologians that had the church paid attention to Romans and fully lived it out, that the gospel would have surely been preached in all the world. We're still here because we keep having to understand how grace works. Grace is not an excuse to sin. Grace is to help us overcome sin. Grace is the power of God working in our lives. In the society that we live in right now, there's not a full knowledge that all have sinned. People want to make excuses for sin. We have to come to the realization, Lord, I've sinned and I need you. Even one sin condemns. But thank God for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who saves. All men need saving. There's consequences for sin. We're living in a world right now that's suffering the consequences of sin. Some of us are wearing masks because we're dealing in a world that has consequences for sin. We also know that we need the grace of God. We have separation from God. We have a misunderstanding of who he is and how much love he has for us. And we're dealing with a fact that there's loss of eternal life for not paying attention to what he's provided for us. Growing in the knowledge of Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18, 1, 2, 3, 11. How to grow? Start with trust and conviction, which is faith. Strive for excellence, which is virtue. Increase understanding, which is knowledge. Discipline mind and body, which is self-control. Bear up under trials, which is perseverance. Do all to please God, which is godliness. Love the brother, which is brotherly love. 
with an act of goodwill towards all, which is love. We have these helps that have been provided for us in our time. There's books that are written for our inspiration for those of us who have reached this age of 2020. There's a book called Patriarchs and Prophets that helps us understand a lot of what happened in the Old Testament. Prophets and Kings, The Desire of Ages, which is about the life of Christ. The Acts of the Apostles, which helps us understand how the early church started in great controversy, which explains the whole controversy that's going on in the universe between Christ and our adversary, Satan, and that we ultimately will be victorious, more than conquerors, through him that loved us. Luke 24, 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, all, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. We believe the Bible, the history of the Bible, the unity of the Bible, the revelation in the Bible, and the application of God's word in our life. Okay, I'm finished with this part, so I'm just finished reading. Thank you. Brother Marty has done excellent today in praising God and helping us understand the word of God. In closing, it's 1149 right now, in closing, I wanted to share with you uh, something that um, is of great value uh, in, in my opinion. God is, God is really marvelous to us. There's a verse in Revelation 10, 6 that says, there shall be time no longer. Now in that verse, it, will, it, it tells us that prophetic time will be no longer. In other words, there's a 2300-day there's a prophecy that was given in 457 BC. And Christ coming to earth and starting his ministry in 27 AD and going to Calvary's cross in 31 AD and his resurrection and return to heaven and the persecution of Stephen, uh, the deacon Stephen, marked the turning of the gospel to the Gentiles and then in 1844, it marked a time when time would be no longer. No longer for man to, to waffle around about eternity. Christ is coming again, y'all. And what we have to grow accustomed to is the fact that what we're facing right now we're going to keep facing situations because we're on earth. And this earth is in an adversarial relationship against the will of God. And so what we have to be able to adapt to is the fact that God provided a whole system for us to survive, and it's by his grace. God had to jumpstart his word three times. He jumpstarted his word with the prophet Elijah when they went to Mount Carmel. If you can remember the question he asked, he asked, how long halt you between two opinions? People had gotten so far away from God that they could not even answer the question. And then the next time he gave a vision to Ezekiel he gave the vision to Ezekiel of the Valley of Dry Bones. I believe it's in Ezekiel 38. And the prophet asked, uh, God asked the prophet, can these bones live? And the prophet said, thou knowest. He was jump-starting his church. And then in Acts uh, chapter 2, we had the day of Pentecost. He was jump-starting his church again. And in our times, 
we have the form in the latter rain. God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on us so that we can finish the work that he's set forth for souls to be saved. The real question that each of us ask each day is, Lord, how am I going to make it? I don't know about you, but I've had to ask several questions over the last four or five months. I've had to ask them how I'm going to make it. And there's different types of battles that one fights, either with their health, with their strength, with their spouse, with their job, or the lessness of it. So we're dealing with things that we're not totally accustomed to, but our only solution right now is to pray, seek God, ask for his Holy Spirit, and ask for the grace of God. I talked to a neighbor the other day. Um, he has a huge white beard, <laughs> really huge white beard. And uh, he said to me, he says, you know, I feel sorry for my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. He says, because I don't know what they're going to be facing. Those of us who are here today, joining in this worship service, we can say we have hope in Jesus Christ. We can say we have hope in his soon return. We have hope for eternal life for our children and, and children's children. We have hope. And it is in, it's in Christ that we have hope. God is still wanting to jumpstart his church. He wants to pour out his Holy Spirit on us. Are we seeking his face each day? Are we seeking him earnestly? Are we seeking him with all that we have in our soul? In our Sabbath school lesson this morning with Brother Bill, we talked about being a witness. It's not the eloquence, it's not the education, it's the experience that we need in order to be a faithful witness. We have a faithful witness in heaven. Jesus Christ came down here for us. Now he's asking us, turn our hearts over to him and we can be a faithful witness for him. There are people that I'm sure that you want here with you, at least in church, that you want to know they're going to church. But you may be their only witness. You may be the only one speaking Jesus Christ to them, the pure gospel truth, the true gospel of grace, that God can take any sinner from anywhere at any time and redeem them, restore them, and make them whole again. There are many folks right now suffering. I don't know about you, but I know some people suffering. I heard some people on the prayer list this morning that are suffering. They need your prayers, and we need your prayers among each other. We all need each other's prayers. And I thank all of those that came this morning. God bless you as you depart. We're gonna say, um, we're gonna say a short prayer right now. And I'm going to just ask the congregation, as you're thinking about uh, your life and what you're going through and what others are going through around you and your loved ones, as you're thinking through these things, just remember that you have a, a God in heaven, you have a Christ in heaven that wants to see you in person. He wants to save you personally. He wants to save us. Okay, I'll say a short prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for allowing us to come to you and worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you for so many times that you've come through and, and helped us. Heavenly Father, this time that we're in is so different than any other time. I was born in 1961 and I've never seen times like these. So I'm praying, Lord, for everyone here and as they're praying for one another and we're praying for their families. As we lift our voices and our hearts up to you, we just ask that you would take our
prayers, Lord, and do with them what you will to answer them according to your will and to your purpose and to your plan. Praying for your Holy Spirit, praying for grace, praying for love, Lord. We're praying so that you can jumpstart your church in a way, Lord, that you can see what you want to see in it so that you know we're ready to come home. We're ready to depart when you When you return, in Jesus' name and for his sake, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Number 312. So stand as we sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for your Holy Sabbath day. Thank you so much for the fellowship. As we depart, we ask that you would be with us. May your grace, your mercy, your peace, your love, all that you've sent for us to have, may we have it today. Bless us, Lord. Give us strength. Give us health. And we plead with thee, O oh Lord between the porch and the altar for the saving of our souls and the saving of the souls of those around us. And we love you, and we appreciate all that you do for us, Lord. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ, the righteous. Thank you for his intercession. Thank you for your mercies, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah and amen. Thank you. Praise God in Jesus' name. Amen. amen.